And here's what it says in Acts chapter 3, verse 1. It said, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple about the time of prayer. At three in the afternoon, now a man was lame from birth, and he was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those who are going into the temple courts. Let's just pause that for a second. A gate called Beautiful. I need, I need somebody to help me. Tyler, you seem like a big, strong guy. Can you help me real quick? All I need you to do is take this end of it. Actually, take that end. Just walk it out real quick. So there at the, 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 the temple has a gate called Beautiful and the stop at 30 feet. Find it, find it, find it, find it. Right about, no? Keep going. All right, keep going. 30? 30? Okay, now retract it. Retract it, pull it in. So that, that was 30 feet right there, right? All right, keep going. Keep going, keep going. How tall, how, Daryl, how tall do you think the ceiling is? 20 feet? I think that's a good guess. Anybody else? 20 feet? 16, 19 and a half. Kyle is usually really good at guessing things. I'm actually going to go with him. Don't take that personally. It's probably 19 and a half feet if we measured it. Could you, could you uh, have, let's see, um, get, get a volunteer. Maybe Kyle, could you hold that for him? And then go back again, another, another 30 feet. Just keep going. Just keep going right there. Perfect, Kyle. Thank you. Keep going, keep going, keep going. There's a door behind you. It's made out of glass. It's very expensive. Be careful. My goodness. So what are we at there? That's 60 feet? We're not even, we're not even there yet. Guys, the temple had a gate called Beautiful, and the gate was 70 feet tall. 70 feet tall, and he broke the tape measure. I mean, it's that long. So from here, even past the doors, that's fine, Tyler, thank you. You guys can wrap it up, and I'll, I'll just take it in my office. Um, I'll take it out of your paycheck, though. So this distance right here, from the front to the back, is the height of these doors. Are you getting a picture of how huge these doors are? And they're not just like regular doors. These are beautiful doors, and that's why it's called the gate that is called beautiful. Seventy feet tall, according to the ancient historian Josephus, who lived at that time, and they place this guy here at the entrance to the gate called Beautiful. So think about this. Back in Christmas in December, you know you have to go to the store and you're walking in the store and they got the bell ringer at the door, right? They got the bell ringer at the door and you're coming in and they're like, excuse me, could you spare just a little change? I noticed that you're going shopping for your already spoiled kids. Do you have a, <laughs> you got a few coins? Well, you got spoiled kids too? Okay, that's good. You put a couple coins in the bucket, and you're like, oh, are you going to be here when I come back out? Okay, I'll catch you when I come back out. And then when you come out, you're like checking, making sure they're not there, and you run. Um, so this guy is placed, he's kind of like a bell ringer, except for he's the guy with the needs directly. He's the one with the needs, so he's waiting right there. Now, a lot of confused Jews that would pass by this gate would publicly state things like this, that, that men like him were paying the consequences for their parents' sin. They would say stuff like that. You think you have a self-esteem issue. They would say, you're paying the consequence for your parents' sin. The Jews would say stuff like that. They would believe in this generational curse idea, and they would say stuff like that. Let me just rabbit trail a little bit. I think it's worth it because I want to show you from the scripture. I want to put to death the idea that God curses people's children because of something that they did as a parent. I want to put that to death. I'm going to use the scripture to do it. In Ezekiel 18, God specifically tells the people through the prophet to stop saying that children are cursed because of their parents. Now, I want to be sensitive to this because some of us have heard a preacher or somebody on TV maybe or somebody like weird internet site or something where they said the opposite. I don't care. I really don't care what they have to say about it. I care what the Lord says. And he's been specific. He's been clear about this issue. So that's why I'm going to put a nail in the coffin right now. So it's in Ezekiel 18. And here's how God starts the conversation through the prophet. Here's what he says, Ezekiel 18. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the people in the land of Israel? The parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. All right, that's a clever Old Testament way of saying that the parents mess up and the kids are damaged because of it. God's going after them. That's an Old Testament way of saying that. 
But listen to what what God says uh, further in the passage. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. He says, no more. Don't say that. Verse 4, for everyone belongs to me. The parent and the child alike belong to me. Do you see the father nature of God? He says, stop it. So when you hear the TV preacher say, well, it's, it's because of your parents. You're suffering because of your parents. You can change the channel. It's really easy to do, and I wish that you would. Do not fall for this doctrine. It leads down a confusing road. It makes people behave strangely. They start to believe strange things. They start to say, like, well, we're cursed. Our family's cursed. We have this thing that's hanging over us. Do you know what that is right there with hanging on our back wall? That's a, that's a curse breaker. That's a curse breaker. Anything that you believe was over you, it's done with. And in fact, it's been done with because God is a father to you. The scripture says, if you ask me for something, you think I'm going to hand you a snake? God is not that kind of father. He gives blessings. He cares for you. He sees you as his child. Do not fall for this doctrine that God is somehow punishing children some evil curse plan. It doesn't work like that. But God does say in that same passage that the person who sins bears consequences. And that is just as spiritual, but it's not magic. It's just as spiritual. You see, I think when when we start having this conversation about curses, people get this real magical idea in their head. No, the, the nations around Israel, they believed in all sorts of weird forces and magic and stuff that doesn't make sense. The people around Israel, they believe in that kind of thing. But Israel was not supposed to fall for that. Israel was supposed to believe in real actions and real consequences. That there is fruit to the things that you do as a person. Natural law, common influence, not magic. Common influence, it's just as spiritual but we can see where it comes from. It's not this magical, oh, God's after me. He's a monster God who wants to curse me. It's not the same. It's consequences which are spiritual. I think I've hammered that one enough. So in this way, I'll give you an example. If a parent decides, well, I don't want to work. They should work, but I don't want to work. And they teach their children this bad work ethic, that's not a magical thing. That's common influence. You've now taught your child it's not that important to work. So if your child doesn't want to work anymore, it's your influence on them. That's a consequence, and it is spiritual. It is spiritual. The lessons you teach your kids are spiritual, but it's not magic. It's more than that, actually. So God does warn Israel from time to time about natural law consequences, common influences, that they're bad, and we should not... Uh, we should not hinder the fact that we have something to do with the process with our kids. Our parenting does matter quite a bit. Uh, back to the situation today, though. Today's passage in Acts chapter 3. You have this beautiful gate, right? Beautiful gate. I think there was an incredible expenditure of money and resources to make a gate that huge. In the ancient days, like, I don't even know how they got that thing put up. What kind of hinges does that thing move? I don't get it. I don't exactly understand how they could build this. It got destroyed. I think in 70 AD, I think they came through and destroyed this beautiful gate. But this huge gate, how did ancient people do that? It's amazing. Probably call, it probably costs a lot of money to build. The ironic thing about a gate called beautiful is gates do what? They keep people out. Isn't that funny? They invested a lot of their money and their time and their resources into something that keeps other people out. <laughs> That's interesting. A gate called beautiful. And here, they place this man who spent his whole life hunched over on the ground, no calluses probably on his feet, but instead on his palms and maybe on his side where he laid day after day, at, and he would watch beautiful people. Think about this. The man who was lame from birth, he's laid there at beautiful gate. He would watch beautiful people walk through the beautiful gate on their beautiful working legs with their beautiful friends while he sits alone and begs. This situation is anything but beautiful. This is an ugly situation. Not to mention, a lot of the people that are walking by are saying things like, well, he's paying the consequences of his parents' sin. Somebody sinned here. 
It's their fault. How about that for self-esteem? You know, it's, it's really hard for us to put ourselves in other people's shoes, but I think it's important that we recognize where other people come from because otherwise you, you really can't preach the gospel in a language that makes sense to them. Do you know Spanish? Not at all? Okay, I know like that much. Now, if you didn't know Spanish and I started speaking to you in Spanish, you'd be like, why are you doing that? And I started yelling at you. You'd be like, it's not helping. You know, you try to speak to people who have been in a different place of life than you've been at, but you don't put yourself in their shoes and it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I think sometimes we need to humble ourselves because it, it's really difficult to relate to someone when you have no idea what it's like to be them. This guy could not go much lower in life than to start on the floor and never leave the floor. He, he never left it. He was born and he stayed there. Now, that's a physical condition, but I guarantee you know some people in your life who were born and they just kind of stayed there. They never got off the ground. Never good with making friends. Just couldn't, just couldn't seem to make friends. Something weird about them, kind of goofy. Nobody ever took the time to slow down and say, hey, how are you doing? No, nobody asked that. They said, excuse me, thank you. There's a passing by. Can you hand me that? You know. But never, how are you doing? Who are you? They never took the time to know them. And I get this picture of this man who was lame from birth as a person that people knew about. Like maybe they knew his name. So they could say, excuse me, move. Here's a couple coins. I don't think he felt awfully related to. I don't think he felt very invited sitting outside the temple. I don't mean to take such a long time to get you know, into Acts chapter 3, but I want us to realize how many people we walk by on a day-to-day -day basis and maybe not even given the Holy Spirit a chance to speak to us about what our role could be with that other person. So often, we're in a hurry and we walk over hurting people to help ourselves. That's something I wrote down a while back and I wanted to include it in the sermon because it's true. I noticed something about myself one day. There was somebody inconvenient to me and I, I kind of walked over that person to go help myself and do what I needed to because I, I got things to do. I got business. And after I was done, I realized, God, did I just, oh man, I, I missed a big one. I missed a big one just because they were inconvenient. I walked right over them, this hurting person. And it pains me to, to look at those things. I'll tell you what, if you want testimonies, church, who wants testimonies? Like you want big, God-sized testimonies in your life. Who wants that? Come on, who wants that? If you want God-sized testimonies in your life, you're going to have to slow down and start looking at people. I mean, really. How many times you walk through Walmart and kind of like this, you're like, oh my gosh, I hope I don't see anybody I know. <laughs> oh my gosh. And you see that person you know and you're like, nope, I don't need cereal after all. I'm going to go over there. Why do we do that? I mean, why do we do that? It's so funny that we do that. And it's a common experience, obviously. But what if that person needed to pray with you in the cereal aisle? Like, what if that was life-changing for them in the cereal aisle that day? Your little bit of boldness that day changed the people, perhaps, that are walking around you seeing that you have the ability to be spiritual in the cereal aisle. And I'm not talking about being weird. I'm not talking about praying big prayers and making people look at you on a street corner. I think that's weird. I'm just talking about being a real Christian and seeing people like, man, that, that'll change. That'll change the hearts of many people. I remember one time I was praying with somebody at Walmart. It was a coworker, And I just noticed that they were down and, and I, I ran into them and, and I made sure to go talk to them and see them, make sure they're, they were excited to talk, you know. And uh, they were just down. So I, I prayed for them. And I noticed that while we were praying, there were people walking around and I could just see it on them. Like, man, I wish somebody, I wish there was somebody who could bear some of my burden. I wish there was somebody who would go out of their way to ask me how I'm doing. Just to see me. I think there's a lot of people that feel that way. So if you want a testimony, you're going to have to start looking at people. Acts chapter 3, verse 3, we'll finally get back to it. Verse 3, and here's what it says. When he saw Peter and John, talking about the lame man who was begging, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him. He looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. 
So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them, a little bit of money maybe. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. Amen. I'm glad I can relate to the scripture already right there. This is like a real personal passage for me. Silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he got down and he touched him. Taking him by the right hand. You have to understand, beggars in these days and ages, you know that people like, they did their business like in the street, like right there. And they weren't clean. And beggars weren't clean. And they weren't clean. Did I make that clear? They weren't clean. He's outside the temple because he's ceremonially unclean. There's something wrong with him. He's unclean. And these guys, before they got in the temple, went down and they took their probably kind of clean hands and they touched this very unclean person. I don't think I need to preach anymore about that. You get the idea. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and he began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. In verse 8, I don't want to miss this. Verse 8, go back to verse 8 with me. It says this. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them. He went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. One of my favorite passages, I actually couldn't stop reading it. You might think this is weird, and that's fine. I'm a little weird. I couldn't stop reading this. He went with them. He went with them. They were together. They were together. It wasn't like, well, you got your miracle. All right, we'll see you around. You should really come to my church sometime. Oh, good, find a pew. It's over there. All right, we'll see you around. He wasn't abandoned. They were with him. Together. So the man that was not anything beautiful to look at by the world's standards was chosen to display the beauty and the glory of God. So often the scripture makes it clear to us that God chooses the humble situation, the humble person, the humble circumstances to glorify himself. He's not looking for the person who has everything together. Stop thinking that way. He's looking for the person who has a humble heart and says, God, I just want to glorify you. I don't exactly know how to do it yet. I want to glorify you. And he did it right. The lame man who was healed, he did it right. It says that he came in leaping and praising God. And some of us won't sing a song on a Sunday morning because I don't really like that one very much. That's not my favorite song. It's got that weird word in there. I don't know. My goodness. If somebody was healed in this place, do you think they'd be like, well, I'm going to praise God in the next song. This one isn't my favorite, you know. The next, no, I'll I'll sing the next one, I promise God. I'll get there. And you're like, well, he was healed. I mean, he was healed. It's a big deal. He was healed. Well, what about you? What do you believe about yourself? Do you actually believe that Jesus set you free? Do you actually believe that you have life inside of you that comes from the living God? Do you actually believe that sin was killing you? Then you got a reason to sing and jump, and maybe even that song where Pastor Andrew can't get the drum beat right, you know, that's fine. (laughs) Just sing louder and you can't hear me, it's good. Verse 10, it says that the people recognize this man as the one who was healed, as the person who used to have some very public needs, very public needs, but something was different. I imagine he walks in, and some of the usual crowd is there, and they're looking at him, and they're like, oh, hey, you. Yeah, we've met before. I'm trying to put it together. Something's different about you, though. Get your hair done? No, no. Different coat, perhaps. No, no, no. Are you taller than you used to be? You're ta- your legs used to not work. Oh, my gosh. 
You used to be the dude who sat outside and you were lame since birth. I remember your family. I remember how you sat there and nobody ever talked to you. You smelled kind of funny. You still smell kind of funny. Oh my gosh, it's you. Do you know that when you share the gospel with someone, when you get invested in somebody else's life and they receive Jesus and they have this transformation from death to life, other people see them. Other people see them and they're like, didn't you used to be the person who had a lot of needs? Like you used to write the Facebook post that was like that long and it was really negative about everything bad in your life. And now you're like sharing Bible passages and scripture and worship songs. There's something different about you. Aren't you a little taller than you used to be? Yeah, I'm standing up tall now. I'm following Jesus. I tell Christians all the time, I've said a lot of times, I'll remind you though, I'm so sick of Christians walking around with their nose down low, their head low, shoulders shrugged. Well, I'm a Christian and the world hates me. Would you stand up tall and have a little confidence, a little boldness, put your head up, put your shoulders back, you don't have to have your nose in the air, but it's okay to be bold and confident. You're not a loser. And that doesn't come from something about you. It comes from something about Jesus. You're not a loser. You can have a little confidence. I'm so glad that he walked in and people recognized him. I want you to walk into this place. I want people to say, hey, I know, I know that person. I want you to come around and make somebody family in this place. And the people that see them, that are watching them from the outside, are going to say something's different about them. I, I need to go to Living Hope Christian Center. I need to go find out what is going on there because if that person can change, then anybody can change. Maybe they could even help me. That's the way a lot of people think. Do you know that? They see somebody else and like, wow, well, if it can help them, maybe it could even help me. That's the testimony of just letting people see what's going on in your life. So church, there are no more temples, but people are still watching and they're seeing us gather for good reason because God wants the world's eyes on us. I don't know if you knew that. God wants the world's eyes on us. And I know some people are like, well, I don't like attention. I don't want people to look at you. You're in the wrong religion. You are seriously in the wrong religion. I'm not saying you have to be the focus. I'm not saying that, that you even can be the focus. Jesus is going to be the focus. But people are going to be watching you. They're going to be looking at you. They're going to be assessing what is the fruit in this person's life. Is it real or are they just fruity? <laughs> it's just weird. Because we've all seen the fake, right? We're going through Acts and we're talking about the Holy Spirit. It's very relevant to bring up the fact that we've seen some fruity fake stuff. Maybe not in this church. I think, I think this church has been very healthy. But we have been a part of movements where we've seen some weird stuff and we said that wasn't God, that was in the flesh. Stop being a weirdo and creeping people out. <laughs> Might be the most spiritual thing I said all day. At the same time, do not deny the move of the Holy Spirit and the realness of a real experience. Do not deny that. Don't hide it. Don't say it's for someone else. It's for you. God wants the world to keep their eyes on us because we are the body of Christ on earth. Jesus said, it's better if I go. I'm going to go. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. You're not going to be orphans. And now the world is looking at us, walking temples. We're walking temples of the Holy Spirit. He lives inside of us. What we need to do is we need to walk through the gates with some people. Now, I don't know. I was talking to Jesse. Um, I was talking to Jesse before the service. And we were talking about, man, what is like, eternity going to be like? And we had these big conversation questions. It's a fun, it's a fun like, conversation to try to have. But we just don't know that much about eternity. We don't. No eye has seen. No mind can comprehend. Right? I don't really know, but I don't know if we walk through the pearly gates the way that uh, some people make it. But I'll tell you one thing. When I walk into whatever that eternity, that kingdom of heaven, that, that, that final thing, whenever I walk in there, I don't want to walk in and say, oh, a bunch of strangers, I'll go meet some people. I hope that I walk in and I'm like, I remember you. I remember when we started talking. I remember you. I remember when I met you at Walmart. We prayed. I hope that I walk into the gates with some other people then I'm not totally alone. I don't stand there and say, well, I looked out for number one and it worked. I want to walk in with other people. Amen. Say, I know you and I know you and I know you and I know you. Lord, we're together. I know these people. This is your church. You know, somebody told me a while back, they said, Pastor Andrew, I'm just not as excited about Jesus as I used to be. I'm just not as excited 
thought about it for a little bit, and I, I never speak to hurt people, by the way. Even if I challenge them a little bit, I never speak to hurt people. I think it's a foolish way to do business. I think you can challenge people without making them feel small or stupid. But I wanted to challenge them. They said, I just, they, I'm not as excited about Jesus as I used to be. And I said, can I just ask you, when was the last time you led somebody to Jesus? And their eyes got big. Oh. I said, well, are you, in, are you involved in the process of discipling anybody right now? Oh, well, I've been really busy. It's been really busy. Now, maybe you're distracted. I think, I think I figured it out. I think you're distracted. I think sometimes we're not as excited about walking through the gates with people because we're just looking out for ourselves. We're distracted by the things we need to get done in, in our own life. But I find that when we focus on other people and when, when we're doing real ministry, when we're leading people to Jesus, when we're discipling them, we are excited about the kingdom of God. We're excited about what Jesus has done. In fact, it reminds us fresh and anew what it means to follow him. So if things have gotten a little dry, let me just challenge you, not belittle you. Let me challenge you. Who are you discipling right now? Are you just looking out for number one? Is it just about you? I arrive safe. I'm with you, Lord. Or are you trying to grab some other people and pull them along with? See that, that will get you excited. That'll cause you to rely on the Lord. You're going to need him. You're going to be in prayer because people are stubborn. Ask me how I know. I'm a people. People are stubborn. It's hard. We've got to pray. We've got to rely on the Lord. There's a mission at hand. And the excuses... Well, I'm too old. I've heard that one. I'm too old to be doing that. Well, you can tell that to Abraham, right? I'm too old. God waited until the second half of Abraham's life to get busy. I'm too old. How about this? I'm, I'm too young. I'm too young. Well, tell that to Timothy. Oh, it turns out God will use the young and the old the same. Well, I don't know a lot about God yet. You can tell that to Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know what I would say about him. Tell that to Nebuchadnezzar. He figured something out. He found something to say. We need to activate the boldness God has already given us permission to operate in. If you didn't know this already, here at Living Hope Christian Center for 2022, our general theme is bold. Bold. And you know what? I don't want to... I don't want to say don't pray for boldness, but real honestly, maybe we should just activate in the boldness God has already given us. Some of us are looking for genie God, like, would you just zap me and make me not like I am? Guess how God doesn't work <laughs> like that. No zapping, doesn't happen. No, maybe we should activate in the boldness he's already given you, the confidence that you have, being a new creation in Christ. See where that takes you. Activate the boldness you have. You know, the main idea in the series we're doing with the college age group right now, it's, it's a series called Goliath Must Fall by Louis Giglio. And um, it's an interesting series. He says that the, the person can go through their life trying to fight their way through life's battles, trying to be bold, maybe have victory someday. Or you can live a life that God has given you from the victory he's already had. It's a change in perspective, but it'll change everything. If you live your life from the victory God has already had, it gives you boldness. If you're just trying to win a battle, well, you're going to fail some, and your boldness is going to diminish if you're looking at it that way. We need to live our life from the victory God has already had. It makes us bold, so we'll do things for the kingdom. Earlier I said that it's time to activate boldness in what God has already done, and the boldness is not based on your performance. Let me make that clear. Your boldness in Christ is not based on your performance. It's based on what he's done, what he's already done. Acts chapter 3, 11, this is the last verse before we finish up pretty quick here. When a pastor says that, by the way, pretty quick here, it's always a lie. I'm just gonna be real, just gonna be real honest with you. 10, 15 more minutes, yeah, half an hour, I don't know. We'll see what the Spirit does. Acts 3, 11. And actually, I'm just gonna read this one verse. Acts 3.11, it says, While the man held on or, or clung to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. He clung to them. He clung to them. This is so important. We need to let people 
connect to us. Sometimes we need to let people cling to us. They really need some help. They really need your help. There are people who just don't understand what it means to follow Jesus. They're babies in the faith and they, they kind of need somebody to cling to. And guess what? There's only one of me. And if I'm doing all the ministry, this church should close right now. Right now. Let's wait for my first failure of any sort. Everybody will leave. Ministry needs to be done by the church, not just the pastor. That's a bad plan. By the church. The Lord said the harvest is great, but the workers are few. That's what he said. The harvest is great. This is good news for you. If you're following the Lord, he's going to use you. He's going to. The harvest is great. Now, some of us, we're going to be better at like starting the conversation with people, getting the ball rolling, opening up on a personal level. Maybe that's the role that God has given you. And that's part of harvesting as well. Perhaps some of you will be more in the transition. You'll pray with people to receive Jesus. You'll walk through those temple doors and see the healing. Maybe that's part of your ministry. But both of them are needed. Both of them are valid. Just letting people connect with you and cling to you, it's going to open doors. So here's my story. Uh, In 2016, I was a high school substitute over the next town over in Bram. High school substitute and uh, self-described kind of nerd, a little bit, a little nerdy. And I would eat in the teacher's lounge with the other teachers. And I kind of had a ministry there with the other teachers. And eventually, the Lord put something on my heart. I was walking to go into the teacher's lounge and I look over at one of the tables and it's filled with kids that I just want to reach because I was a youth pastor in 2016 in Bram and I want to reach these kids and they're kids that are kind of hard to reach because these are, this is the football table, all right? The football table. Like they, they're kind of old school in Bram. They still have a football table of all the guys who sit together. And I'm walking with my tray and, and the Lord kind of stops me I felt him impress on my heart like you should go sit down at that open spot. There's one, one open spot. You should go sit right there. And I was like, <laughs> Lord, uh, I know that I'm like 27, 230 pounds, 6'5". I'm an adult, but what if they take my lunch money? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about these kids. And Lord, like, I know that that one boy, the one boy you want me to sit next to, I know that he knows that I know that he knows he don't like me. He does not like me. You want me to go sit there? And the Lord is so gentle. I don't know how you perceive the voice of the Lord in your life, but he's so gentle with me at times, and uh, I appreciate that. Um, you guys ever see The Office? The show The Office? You remember Stanley? Well, I'm not going to say that God speaks to me in Stanley's voice, but this time it was kind of like that. Boy, did I stutter! Sit down! That's what it was like for me. Was, I just could not go in. So I was going to go into the teacher's lounge, and I just... Nyeh turned around and I started walking over and I could see the eyes of some of these kids were like, don't do it. Don't you sit by us. Don't you sit by us. All right, everybody stop cussing. Quiet. He's coming, you know. Because they know I'm a preacher too and teacher. So I I take the seat and just the eyes of everybody kind of go, didn't feel very welcome in the moment, but I'm, all right, Lord, if you say so. So they're, they're talking, and, and it's around Halloween, I believe, at this time. They start talking about creepy stuff. They start talking about demons and exorcisms and creepy movies. And one of the kids, you know, he says, hey, you're, you're a pastor. What do you think about that stuff? And this was the moment I was waiting for because I got some stories, man. And I've seen some real stuff, by the way seen some real stuff. I've prayed with teenagers. I've, I've seen exorcisms. I've done exorcisms. So I've got some stories to share. And as I start to speak, a couple of the mockers mock. But the boy that I, I think, he don't like me, God. He speaks up and he tells everyone else, shut up. I want to hear him. I believe him. And I was like, well, maybe I do belong at the football table. Well, it took me 27 years to be cool. Still not cool. So he starts to open up and share some really crazy experiences that he's had on a personal level that were frightening to him. And he wants to know, where is God God in all of this? And it's my window. It's my window. 
And man, I didn't crawl through that window. I jumped through that window. And we started having conversation. And it's livening up. And people are coming over to the table because the conversation is getting kind of rowdy and it's exciting. And everybody wants to hear the story. And I'm retelling it. And the first bell rings. And I'm like, guys, I got to go do class prep. We'll talk more later. And I'm trying to get up. And they grab me by the arms and sit me down in the chair. And say, no, 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 no. Do it later. You got to talk to us. Tell us more about what you think about God. I mean, that is a youth pastor's home run, dude. Like, you are not going to leave. <laughs> so I'm kind of looking around at the other teachers that are leaving. I'm like, yeah, I could tell you a little bit more. And so we talk more. And then the next bell rings, and we got a couple minutes. I need to go to my class. So I stand up, and I'm walking. And they are clinging to my clothes with their hands. I mean, there's 20 kids around, and everybody's got an arm <laughs> reaching and clinging on to me as I try to walk to my class, and I walk by my superintendent's office. <laughs> and he does this. What are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, I'll explain it later. <laughs> Just a second. Telling him a story. <laughs> we get to my classroom, and it's like trying to pull wood ticks off. I'm like, no, no, guys, you got to go to your class. you got one minute. Get to your class. We're not in trouble. <laughs> they don't want to leave. They're late for their classes, and I get calls from teachers. Why are all, I mean, there's 20-something kids who are late for class. What, what was going on? And said, we, were just, we were just talking. I'm sorry. And it just causes a stir in the school. All because I said, yes, Lord, I'll, I'll sit down. And it opens a door. And in fact, um, I had the privilege of marrying that young man to his, his Christian wife this last summer. And the ministry continues. And it continues, and it continues. In our college age group, we have people coming in from that event. We have people coming in because they heard of the Lord, just because I, I say, sure, sure. You know, there are times in your life where God is going to call on you to be bold. Do you know that? It might even be public. Maybe not, but it might even be public. There might be somebody who's really in need, and it's going to be your role to reach down and touch them in their life, in the place where, man, this is, you're not real cleaned up yet. You don't really know how to follow Jesus. He's going to call you with the right hand to lift them up and walk with them into the temple court. Maybe that's inviting them into this church. I would love that. I think that's great. Not everybody's ready to attend a church yet, right? Not everybody's ready. So maybe they need to be in your home. Maybe you need to take time and do something bold and invite them into your home and start having the conversations. We need to stop looking at church as a time where like we do, we do this prayer thing and an altar call and then people get saved just up here. What is that? Well, this is an opportunity, but you are a worker for the Lord. And he says the harvest is great. It's the workers that are few. You know what? I know that that's true, but I, I don't want it to be true in my church. I want this to be a church full of harvesters. So my prayer and my challenge for you is actually going to connect to a message I had a while back where I, I said, think of three people. Pick three people in your life. I said this a few months ago. Three people in your life that you're going to start praying for. And I'm telling you today, church, I'm reminding you, don't walk over them and don't walk past them. It might be time to stretch out a hand and say, would you come with me? It's not a matter of just getting them into our church. I like that. But it's a matter of inviting them into the kingdom of God. That is our primary goal here at Living Hope Christian Center. LHCC exists to reach the lost to worship God, disciple believers, and show compassion to a broken world. And if you would do this, you would complete the mission God has given us, especially as a church. If you're willing to do that, would you stand with me today? You know, I don't share these stories to tell you how cool Andrew Shaw is, because I could tell you a lot of stuff, and I have told you a lot of stuff about how not cool I am. <laughs> how I've messed up a lot. I'm very human. My, my reason for sharing testimonies like this is I want to inspire you these kinds of stories, these kinds of breakthroughs, it's for you. The ministry is not for people who wear the fancy clothes or stand up front or sing the song. That is not just for them. It is for you. This is a gift God has given you. He wants you to be bold and you're going to need to go out in the power of the Holy Spirit. Ask him. Act on what he's given you. Expect from him. Expect from him. Let's pray. Father, Father,